Being a writer is one of the few occupations in Tessa that gives the Avatar ability. If he is a writer, some of his strange miracles make sense. Dokja is already thinking about this, so he is asking about it. Meanwhile, the lips of the first apostle subtly twist. Then, he suddenly admits that he wrote the revelation. Dokja doesn't mean it like that, but he is suddenly talking nonsense. For him, it is a truth that isn't possible. He turns his attention to Jung Huck and uses his unique skill, the omniscient reader's viewpoint. That's how he knows. Jung Huck uses his skill to determine when someone is lying. Now, a confident laugh emerges as the first apostle rants that he owns the Book of Revelations. Dokja is certain he's lying, but when he focuses on Jung Hyuk, he confirms that the first apostle is telling the truth. Dokja suddenly panics, and his circuits tangle up. It is not possible, no matter how he thinks about it. He quickly hides his confusion and asks about the kind of revelation he's been talking about. The first apostle exclaims that it's a book about the future, and Jung Hyuk confirms that it's just half the truth. Dokja finds it strange that there is some truth about it. Now, the first apostle is asking about Dokja. Dokja wonders if he writes the revelation and if he should know about him. But he giggles like a leisurely villain while Dokja regains his composure. He doesn't look like the author of Tessa, no matter how many times Dokja observes him. If he is truly the writer of Tessa, there is no way he doesn't know that he gave Dokja a text version of Tessa. Suddenly, the first apostle starts talking about a prophet in Siadi Mun prison, leaving Dokja curious about who he refers to. From there, he attempts to strike a deal with Dokja to trade information for his true identity. But Dokja doesn't intend to reveal his identity to anyone, so he outright rejects it. Realizing that Dokja won't give him anything, he attempts to threaten Dokja. However, Dokja deliberately interrupts him. Now is the time to sprinkle a bit of spice on Jung Hyuk, and Dokja confidently states that he knows much more about the future than he does. Jung Hyuk immediately confirms that his words are valid. The expression of the first apostle stiffens. At this moment, something flashes in his eyes. Dokja also notices something. As far as he knows, Tessa isn't popular, and there is no illegal text version. But if he is the guy that Dokja suspects he is, it would be understandable if this guy has a text version and knows a lot about Tessa. Dokja opens his mouth and asks if he likes to live while copying others. His eyes shake. Dokja firmly believes that the first apostle is a plagiarist. Dokja smiles and mocks him for copying the original Tessa when the world is ending. Meanwhile, Hyun Sung, Hee-won, and Sangha are watching from the platform. The first apostle pales and hurries to look at Jung Hyuk. He wants Jung Hyuk to join him and offer his knowledge of the future. As he continues his rant to help Jung Hyuk win in the future battle, Dokja thinks about how silly he is. Then he says he possesses the prophet attribute, causing Jung Hyuk to activate the Eye of the Sage skill. Dokja attempts to activate his skill again because he wants to know what Jung Hyuk finds out. But he is too exhausted to accomplish it. Jung Hyuk verifies something with Sage's eye, and Dokja doesn't know what that is. The severed head continues to speak and tells Jung Hyuk to kill Dokja for causing a serious butterfly effect, ruining all of his plans. Dokja is outraged and begins to scold the head. Jung Hyuk slowly moves his sword towards Dokja. The first apostle's momentum rises as he shouts at him to kill Dokja. Suddenly, without anyone's knowledge, Jung Hyuk tramples on the head of the first apostle. Then, his blade moves to Dokja's neck. He one is surprised and prepares to fight, but Dokja raises his hand and restrains the party. He is nervous, but it isn't good to anger Jung Hyuk here. Then Jung Hyuk asks the first apostle what he's going to do next. Dokja silently curses Jung Hyuk's bad habit. But unlike how he was unsure when this happened to him on the even bridge, the first apostle doesn't miss a bit answering his question. He firmly believes that Yu Jung Hyuk will kill Dokja. The sword is moving, but what follows isn't the sound of flesh being cut. It's the head of the first apostle that bursts as it is stepped on. Jung Hyuk's sword is soon removed. Jung Hyuk's decision to spare him leaves Dokja a little taken aback. They soon exchange glances for a moment before Jung Hyuk walks away. Dokja wonders where he is going and if he will just leave Jihai here. Jung Hyuk responds that the plan has also been altered due to changes in the future. Upon hearing it, Dokja attempts to offer his assistance. But Jung Hyuk turns towards him and says that his debt has been paid off and that his last favor is not taking away his flag. That annoys Dokja, and he counters his remarks by telling him he can't leave the station without permission or get punished. Jung Hyuk slowly moves his hand towards the hilt of his sword. In this scenario, Dokja quickly adds that he knows he's going to Yonggu Station and takes the black flag to complete the king's path. Once again, Dokja offers help, and Jung Hyuk blurts out that it's faster if he takes Dokja's flag instead. Dokja makes a smirk and challenges him to do it. It is a gamble at best. Jung Hyuk can stab his neck before the effect of the punishment appears, but Dokja remains confident in his stance. Dokja also adds that he doesn't need to go towards Yonggu. He simply needs to take over the territory of the tyrant king. 
However, there are only 48 hours left until the end of the fourth scenario, so Doc Jin knows that Jung Hyuk cannot do it alone. Jung Hyuk hesitates, and Doc Jin knows he has hit the spot. Then Doc Jin mentions Jung Hyuk throwing away his family member at this time, which manages to anger Jung Hyuk. He jumps back immediately as Jung Hyuk's power emits from his body, intending to kill him. Meanwhile, he went and sang a worry for Doc Jin's safety on the platform. The atmosphere is strained, but Doc Jin doesn't let it affect him as Jung Hyuk finally wants to cooperate. And from there, Doc Jin asks what the first apostle's attributes are. After a while, Doc Jin calls Min Siab and Sungkook, but Doc Jin wonders if he must tell them what is happening. Before Doc Jin opens his mouth, Min Siab asks who the first apostle might be. Doc Jin hesitates momentarily before asking what they know about a novel called Quintuple S Great Infinite Regressor. Sungkook raises his hand because he recognizes the title. Then, the two speak loudly as memories about the novel pop up. As Doc Jin expects, these guys must be interested in web novels if they read Tessa. Actually, Doc Jin is also reading that novel. He reads Tessa at the time and accidentally clicks on it since it is on the today's best list. He is surprised to see that the development and setting of the novel are similar to Tessa. Doc Jin leaves a comment as soon as he reads it. Instead of facing a plagiarism controversy, he faces criticism for comparing it to a bad novel. He even receives terrible messages from the readers of that book. Now, Doc Jin explains that the first apostle is the author of the Quintuple S Great Infinite Regressor, and he may have a copy of his own plagiarized work. He copies the original plot so he can see the future of this world to a certain extent. That makes Sungkook and Min Siab worry that he will be invincible. But Doc Jin doesn't worry much about it because he only copies the early parts. After a little more time, the information he knows decreases. It is natural, because after chapter 100, Doc Jin is the only reader of Tessa. Meanwhile, on the other side of the station, Sangha and Hiwon approach Jehai, who has just woken up. After discussing the first apostle, Doc Jin is told that the tyrant king holds some prophets as prisoners to give him information. The remaining time until the scenario ends is 48 hours. Doc Jin finds it challenging to hunt him alone, so he decides to disrupt the source of their information. If the tyrant king uses the prophets, Doc Jin can exploit it. Then Doc Jin explains to Min Siab and Sungkook that they will make a text of the Quintuple S Great Infinite Regressor and spread it. If there are several enemies, the answer is to make them fight against each other. Doc Jin's plan is clear. He borrows a laptop from Pildu and explains to Sungkook and Min Siab that the plan itself is simple. They make a text of the plagiarized writer's novel. Now, spread it among the people at each station. The first apostle, the plagiarist, has information about the third and fourth regressions that are the beginning of Tessa. Like informed people, he monopolizes information and hides it from the prophets. On the other hand, the tyrant king is one of Seoul's seven kings who uses the revelations after learning about the existence of the prophets. The person who wants to monopolize information and the person who tries to dig it out. It is obvious what happens if the two of them face each other. Doc Jo also adds information and items that lure the plagiarist and the tyrant king. A few moments later, Min Siab pulls his hair because it is hard to write a novel, but Doc Jo tells him to go easy since they just need information that will attract them. He is also worried that Hyun Sung and Jihai will be shocked about being characters in the story. Whether he likes it or not, they will find out this world is a novel someday. But it doesn't have to be right now. Then Min Siab unexpectedly says he doesn't need to worry about it because he has already tried to test some people by saying that this world is a novel. But they don't understand it at all. It is an unexpected piece of information. Min Siab also adds that this is how the first apostle found the prophets easily. Doc Jin suddenly feels uneasy when he hears this and asks them what the difference is between the characters and them. However, Min Siab's response does not answer his question. They are obviously outsiders of the novel, like him. And Doc Jin can tell because if the person is a character, he can see their information, but not long after, it gets updated, and he can look at their information in the character list. He is wondering if everyone becomes a character over time. He looks at Sangha and Gilyoung momentarily and activates his character list. Unfortunately, he still can't see the information for both of them. Soon after, Misiab is nearly finished with the novel. The quality is so bad that if it were serialized, but that doesn't matter right now. The first stage is spreading the information that the Book of Revelations is leaked. Sungkook is wondering if there is enough time to spread the information. So, Doc Jin assures him that Dinghoon will take care of it. For the stations that lack internet connections, he already has the perfect person to spread them. Kang il -hun assures him that he is fit for the job, and Doc Jin also agrees because he has the perfect set of skills to spread rumors. It's finally time to utilize the attribute of a rumor expert. 40 hours are remaining until the end of the scenario. Doc Jin finally summons the Chung Nero group members and announces that their group will be wiped out if they can't take Changsun Station in the next 40 hours. And their journey isn't easy since they have to go against the Tyrant King. 
he remains one of the top seven kings of Seoul and holds the largest territory among them. Doctor also adds that the tyrant king likes to keep beautiful or handsome men and women as concubines. At the same time, any ugly people are killed or become slaves. From there, he one frowns and starts mocking Dokja, saying that he will be a slave if he gets caught. Annoying Dokja, he shrugs it off and tells them they have two options. Either take his flag or take over his headquarters, Dabong Station. Neither is easy, so he decides to get to the point. They go to Gwanghwamun. He one wonders why and Dokja explains that he leaks a bit of information. Now, they must consider the time, and everyone should be prepared. Out of nowhere, Dokja receives notifications that his copy of the novel is being sold in an auction, and simultaneously, Ding Hoon's message pops up on his smartphone. At that moment, a trembling voice is heard from the air. De Young wonders if he's a scammer and tells him that the constellations are excited about it. However, he worries that spreading information like this puts Dokja at a disadvantage. But Dokja assures him it won't turn bad for him and demands his earnings from the auction. While everyone talks amongst themselves, Dokja earns 16,000 coins. Obviously, he doesn't release the information for free. But if he sells it, of course, they will buy it. And the 16,000 coins are his profit. After everything is clear, Dokja tells everyone that he will sleep for a while, and Hyun calls him out for being too laid back. But he simply smiles and ignores her. Dokja lies down, and Sangha covers him with a thin blanket. He one still finds it absurd. After a while, a system message is heard in his blurred consciousness. The exclusive skill, Omniscient Reader's Viewpoint Stage 3, is activated. Currently, Dokja figures out that the Omniscient Reader's Viewpoint is divided into three stages. In the first stage, he reads the simple actions or emotions of characters, like when he fights Namwoon. The second stage allows him to see and read the character's mind, just like when he is on the even bridge with Jung Huck. Now, the third stage allows him to see the surrounding scenery where the characters are located or directly immerse himself in the character. It's like when he suddenly finds himself at the station with Jung Huck. In the third stage, Dokja's consciousness is unstable, and the characters need to think about each other at the same time. That's how he is with Ilhan, muttering to himself that he has already spread the rumors. After a while, Dokja's point of view shifts to Ilhan and he immediately recognizes a man wearing a crown and a coat as the Tyrant King. He asks about the legitimacy of the new revelation, and his informant assures him that it's all legitimate. The King laughs, revealing his teeth, and asks everyone to go to Gwanghwamun. Before the others arrive first, Dokja is glad that his plan is going according to plan. The Tyrant King is finally moving. Now, the problem is on the other side, and he thinks about Minsiab right away. The timing is good. Minsiab is already at Sejong University and is heading to Gwanghwamun in advance. He now looks at the surrounding scenery. People are in the lower part of the building, and as Dokja thinks, the plagiarist is the fastest. Gwanghwamun contains one of the hidden pieces most useful for the third regression. The plagiarist can't run away from this place. However, the issue is that more people are arriving. Yung Yungpo, Yongsen, and Seong Donggu, the kings on those sides, move as well. But Dokja smiles because it is precisely what he is hoping for. A few minutes later, his consciousness rises silently. His senses slowly return to reality, and the skill ends. He just now realizes that the third stage is more tiring than he thinks, and he can't maintain it for long. Furthermore, he does not always acquire a skill when utilizing stage 3 of the omniscient reader's viewpoint. It seems like a reward that can be obtained by entering the first-person protagonist's point of view. Unfortunately, he doesn't know the entry requirements. After Dokja sits up, he sees Hyun mocking him for talking about his mom while he is asleep. It is hard to know whether this is the truth, so he gives a cursory reply that he's worried for his mom. Standing up, he asks Hyun not to participate in the Gwanghwamun battle this time. A few hours later, the Chungmuro group members wave as they watch Dokja and Sangha leave. Dokja thinks of how, in just a few days, Yu Sangha's popularity pierces the sky. She has been leading the people for a short amount of time, but everyone is concerned about her. However, Sangha looks uneasy. She is currently experiencing self-deprecation and is concerned about her usefulness compared to Hyun Sung or Hee Won. Dokja decides who will stay in Chung Yuro and who will go to Gwanghwamun after talking with Hee Won. He decides that Pildu and Hyun Sung will stay behind. While Hee Won has her mission, Dokja still goes to Gwanghwamun with Sangha, Gilyeong, and Sungkook. Aside from Jihai and Junghyuk, who are impossible to control, the core members are them. Sangha's expression brightens as Dokja mentions that she learned some Korean history. He asks if she remembers the statue of Samyong Dang from last time, and he tells her that there are many similar things on the way to Gwanghwamun. She gets immediately excited when Dokja tells her that her mission is to find historical items. They gather as many items on the way to Gwanghwamun as possible, fully aware that they will be outnumbered. 
Perhaps the Tyrant King has hundreds of incarnations, and the plagiarist has his own forces. Dokja needs to be cautious of the kings who come from Yongyunpo, Yongsen, and Xiangdonggu. The latter part of the fourth scenario is just like a proxy war for the constellations. Sangha suddenly remembers a shrine nearby and suggests they stop by because she believes there will be good items in there. However, she has her doubts because the shrine isn't based on Korean history. Dokja is shocked to discover a well-known shrine honoring one of China's greatest generals right in the middle of the city as they arrive. Sangha asks with an intense expression what they should do. And as Dokja looks around, he can't see an idol. He realizes this is different from Samyongdeng and they're not always able to get a good reward for destroying the idol. So, he suggests everyone collect water from the shrine and pray quietly. Some time is passing. Then, a system message is heard that surprises everyone. It seems that the shrine is currently being neglected. But the constellation known as Lord of the Beautiful Beard is currently blessing them with a boost in stamina and strength that lasts for 24 hours. The Lord of the Beautiful Beard is Chinese, but he is a great person that almost everyone in South Korea knows. This constellation is Guan Yu from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Meanwhile, Sungkook is happy because he feels like they hit a jackpot. Suddenly, a bug hops onto Gilyoung's finger and he quickly warns Dokja. They all become alert when they see a group walking in the distance. There are about 50 people, and they all wear clothing that represents different historical periods. Meanwhile, Dokja thinks they come from a museum gallery, and it looks like they are all handsome men. Sungkook tells Dokja he recognizes a man named Hewing Sungmin in the first row of the group. He comes forward, points his spear towards Dokja, and asks who he is. Dokja already knows who they are, but to avoid answering, he turns the question back on them and asks about their identity. Suddenly, a woman's voice is heard from among the group of men, asking if Dokja is also a king because he holds a flag. The men move in unison, and a woman dressed in a royal costume appears in the center of the ranks. Sungkook suddenly yells, recognizing her as Min ji Won and fanboying over her. Dokja immediately notices how the hypnotist is being bewitched, and he hits him from the back. He activates his skill to snap him out of it. Almost instantly, Sungkook returns to his normal self while Jiwon snickers. Dokja wonders how Sungkook recognizes the name Min Jiwon as if she is a person who actually exists. He immediately uses his profiling skills towards her, and, as expected, she is the king of beauty in the original Tessa. Dokja decides to greet her as well, and she smiles, thinking that she also has Dokja under her spell. But Dokja deliberately speaks like he is in a historical drama. He then tells her how she has a very high degree of synchronization with her sponsor, and Dokja tells her how honored he feels to meet the last queen of Scylla. The knowledge that Dokja is aware of her greatly disturbs the sponsor of Min Jiwon. Dokja, as the sole reader of Tessa, knows that the coordination between sponsor and avatar has been overturned. The sponsor forces their unfulfilled wish onto their incarnation. As Tessa develops, the three areas of Xiangdonggu, Yongsengu, and Yongyunpo Gu are fighting fiercely just like the present day is on the Korean peninsula. Suddenly, a message pops up in front of Dokja. Jiwon tells him that her sponsor wants to see his sincerity by accepting the scenario. Dokja stares blankly at the scenario window as he reads through it, mostly unimpressed by the low reward. Jiwon wants him to be her subordinate and help her win the war because small groups like his are being taken out. But Dokja simply shrugs and rejects the offer. Jiwon is left speechless, and some of the men even open their mouths in disbelief. Dokja once again repeats that he won't accept her offer and asks everyone to leave. But she loses sight of reality as she becomes immersed in her acting. She is an excellent actress, and due to her deep synchronization with her sponsor, she lives thinking she really is the last queen of Scylla. Dokja worries about how to deal with her when she boasts about what she can accomplish when Sangha handles it for him. From her studies, she knows that Scylla is the weakest country in the Three Kingdoms. Jiwon pales from the surprise remark. She accuses Sangha of not knowing Korean history that well just because she has a first grade certificate on it. But Dokja interrupts and tells everyone to just leave because Jiwon doesn't know history well either. Jiwon's face flushes with embarrassment as her offer is met with indifference. She attempts to sweeten the deal, but Dokja still walks away. If only she knew how much he earns from the constellations because of this and the profit he makes from the auction. Dokja maintains his stride, paying no heed to her relentless bidding. Her desperation is palpable as she attempts to get his attention. So he halts his footsteps and sighs. For a second, Jiwon believes that she wins but Dokja asks for 10,000 coins unbeknownst to her. Jiwon appears surprised as he contemplates his proposition. Seeing how things get more interesting, Dokja increases the price to 20,000 coins. She glares at Dokja and tells him he's not worth that much. 
However, Dokja counters it by saying he wants to buy her and her soldiers 20,000 coins. Her mouth drops open in a daze before she barely regains her senses. Dokja presses his index finger and thumb together. At the end of his snap, a portion of his coins appears in front of Ji Wan and her soldiers. Min Ji Wan is in a state of shock over Dokja's wealth and barely maintains a poker face. It doesn't take long for distrust to turn into astonishment, and astonishment turns into disbelief. She tells Dokja that he can't buy everything and Dokja easily counters it by telling her she's the one who tried to buy him first. Above all, she is an actress who should know better. Dokja finally turns around and starts walking away, leaving Ji Wen and her soldiers speechless. Once they get a certain distance from the Scylla group, Sangha speaks in a slightly grouchy voice, saying she recognizes the man beside Ji Wen, and Dokja confirms that the man is possibly the incarnation of Guan Cheng. There is a tenacious Huorang who dies in Huang Sanbial and is known for his loyalty to his kingdom. Then she starts asking how Dokja and Sungkook can recognize Ji Won. At the same time, she and Gilyoung are completely clueless as to who she is. Dokja hesitates for a moment to answer the unexpected question. Since she only appears in Tessa, Sangha, and Gilyoung, she doesn't know Min Ji Won. The problem is Sungkook, and as Dokja calls him, he's still at the rear of the group. He seems unable to take his eyes off Ji Won. Dokja tries to ask him how he recognizes Ji Won as a famous actress. And right now, Sungkook's expression is strange. He wonders how he knows her. Dokja quietly activates his profiling skills. He sees Sungkook's information for the second time. Nothing has dramatically changed except for one thing. His ninth renouncer attribute disappears. Dokja is surprised at the possibility of Sungkook becoming a character. In the world of Tessa, attributes only disappear when the qualifications for those attributes are no longer met. All those renouncers know the future of this world. However, the future that Sungkook knows is only near the prologue. The current scenario surpasses the information he knows. Now, a hypothesis emerges in Dokja's mind. Perhaps all those renouncers will become ordinary characters once they catch up with the future they know. It is still a leap, but it is a possible hypothesis, and Dokja wonders if someday he will get to that point. Suddenly, he receives a notification stating that Ji Won is interested in him. All of his thoughts collapse at this absurd message. He reflexively looks back. Ji Won is still standing still and looking the other way. He can't see her face, but her gestures look angry. Now, it suddenly comes to his mind. During the 11th regression, Jung Hyuk grabs Ji Won by her collar, and she has harbored a crush on him since then. Dokja immediately has an ominous feeling but still feels somewhat doubtful because he dislikes Jung Hyuk. However, as Ji Won watches Dokja and his party leave, she suddenly blushes. An hour later, they get closer to Gwang Hwamun. Dokja says this to his party members while moving cautiously. The king is moving towards the National Palace Museum, where the Four Yin Demonic Beheading Sword is located. The strongest quintuple S grade item is hidden in Gwang Hwamun. Dokja knows Sungkook writes it, but his hands and feet curl up just reading the words. Somehow, Sungkook thinks of it as some compliment. Gilyun wonders why they hide instead of trying to get to the sword first. However, Dokja responds that there are better times than this one. The Four Yin Demonic Beheading Sword is indeed at the National Palace Museum, but the item's rating isn't triple S because such a rating doesn't exist. The Four Yin Demonic Beheading Sword boasts outstanding performance, and Jung Hyuk of the Third Regression also favors this sword. The Four Yin Demonic Beheading Sword is good but optional right now. However, someone like the Tyrant King is undoubtedly looking for it. Dokja is finally laying out his plan for his party. They move when the others make the move and take the other artifacts while they aim for the sword. Suddenly, sparks fly, and an intermediate Dokkabi appears out of thin air. He is proud to see everyone gathering in one place, feeling the need to reward them with something. Now, there is the sound of something rising from the center of Gwanghwamun, alerting everyone, including Dokja, the plagiarist, and the tyrant king as the ground starts to shake. There is a single throne covered with a golden light. On top of the throne, the Dokkabi floats above it as the fourth main scenario is updated. There is no explanation yet, but all the kings realize it now. Only one king can take that throne. The system message surprises Sungkook. Dokja is sure that it isn't good timing because another scenario appears before they can complete the clear conditions of the flag scenario. The intermediate Dokkabi explains to everyone that only a king can sit on the throne in the fourth main scenario. Of course, not every king sits on that throne. Only a person who proves their qualifications can sit there. Now, everyone is getting another notification about the qualification of the king. Dokja worries, realizing the burden doubles now that he has to complete the scenario related to the throne while taking down the tyrant king and occupying Changsun Station. The intermediate Dokkabi disappears, and Sangha makes an anxious expression. Dokja also knows their group has a brown flag. 
It is a flag that can be obtained after occupying 10 stations. The clear condition for the throne is that the king must have a black flag, which means he currently occupies at least 20 stations. From Dokja's perspective, no king achieves the black flag at this point. So, Dokja tells Sangha there is a way to get the black flag much faster. It is to take the flag of another group. Clouds of war hang over Guanghuaman. Then, someone orders their group to attack each other. The sound of weapons being pulled out and the organization of battle lines. People are now starting to move. Those competing for a promotion now kill each other with real swords. Those who want a wider territory exploit each other's efforts to occupy more stations. Sungkook watches the war around them and mutters how surreal South Korea is right now. He now wonders if Dokja is also afraid. Dokja is obviously scared. Even though he reads Tessa, he is still a regular office worker. Dokja, who works as a salaryman, is now Dokja, living in the world of Tessa. Death comes, whether he wants it to or not. Most importantly, he feels like he is living right now. He suddenly turns around and begins to alert everyone that they should start moving on his command. They start running with Dokja leading and move towards the Seoul Museum of History. Sangha wonders why they are going to this place, and Dokja explains that they need to find something called a Gampyongui. It is a relic of the Joseon dynasty that resembles a disc, but Dokja doesn't know what floor it is on, so he asks everyone to split. As he speaks, something sharp flies from behind Dokja. He reflexively crouches down, pulling the party members with him. Dokja immediately reaches for his sword while ordering everyone to enter as another set of arrows comes his way. A trace of magic power lingers on the shaft as Dokja fights off the incoming arrows. The unexpected ambush complicates his thoughts, and he wonders if someone reads his movements. Now, a voice echoes through the area. A group of men armed with bows and swords appears a few meters away. Their flag is not visible. Dokja quickly activates his profiling skill on the man in front of the group. He is Chu Wanjin, and the last hero of Huang Sandial is his sponsor. Soon enough, Dokja becomes overwhelmed by the number of arrows and tries to dodge as quickly as possible. He doesn't expect to meet Huang Sandial's avatar here, and given the number of people, it is challenging to handle all of them without increasing his overall stats. An arrow grazes Dokja's arm, but he continues to fight. Currently, he possesses over 60,000 coins. However, the difficulty of the last phase of the fourth scenario increases significantly if he uses coins to raise his overall stats now. It disturbs his entire plan. Suddenly, a voice can be heard. Chu Wanjin and Dokja look to the side and see a familiar person approaching. Jiwon suddenly appears with her soldiers. Chu Wanjin sneers at Jiwon, and she shoots back with a smug expression, mocking the fact that he's nothing but the king of a ruined kingdom. As Jiwon approaches Dokja, he wonders if she is following him here. Then Jiwon's eyes glance at him, and a notification that she has a crush on him reappears. Dokja is at a loss for words and starts sweating when she tells him she's here to repay him for her earlier transgression. Chu Wanjin suddenly laughs at their conversation. He is mocking how personal matters sway a queen like her. Jiwon's captain comes forward on behalf of the Huorang and points his spear towards him. Chu Wanjin's eyes are drawn to the Huorang immediately. He thinks that the situation is very interesting since they work together. The Huorang captain turns red at the words. It reminds Dokja that the Huorang captain's sponsor is Guancheng. In the Battle of Huang Sandial, Guancheng dies from Jiabi cutting his throat. Dokja is glad that Jiwon comes to help, but the relationship between the constellations is the worst. It is like how Guancheng can't win against Jiabik, and they're bound to repeat their history through their avatar. Jiwon also knows this and doesn't look happy, so Dokja tells her to stand down. Then Sangha's voice is heard, and she shows Dokja they have found the Gampyongui. The relic resembling a wall clock glows in Sangha's hands. Right now, Dokja has an idea. He tells Jiwon that they will reenact the Huang Sandial War. The war in which Scylla wins. At the same time, Chu Wanjin uses the stigma of command detachment to order his troops to attack. Now, the roar of battle echoes in the air. The Battle of Huang Sandial occurs between the forces of Scylla and Beekjin Huang Sandial. Scylla manages to win the war thanks to the Huorang sacrifice, and the battle takes Jiabik's life. The captain of Huorang comes forward and shouts to his soldiers not to retreat at any cost. Jiabik's incarnation, Chu Wanjin, confidently declares that he will kill all of them. The Huorang came running towards Chu Wanjin's group with a spear. Dokja shouts immediately towards Jiwen telling her to stop her soldiers. She quickly does as he asks, but no matter how much she orders them to stop, the army seems to have lost its sense of reason, and her orders go unanswered. Jiwon can only watch in horror as none of her soldiers retreat when Chu Wanjin's sword suddenly strikes the captain of Huore. Meanwhile, Dokja silently curses, aware that Guancheng has a slight chance of winning the battle. 
but he believes it is time for the stage to be created. Sparks suddenly fill the surrounding space, and Sungkook is surprised as a holographic dome surrounds them. Seoul's Gwanghwaman transforms into a rugged mountain wilderness. It is a phenomenon that occurs when the coordination between avatars and historical constellations is high. Space transformation summons the spacetime that the constellations are fighting in. Chu Wanjin is filled with joy as he sees the scenery changing. However, the space is the same. It is close to augmented reality. The problem is that this is different for those who summon the stage. Sungkook mutters about how great Chu Wanjin is to have summoned such a place. But Doctor claims that it is possible because Jayabeek is the protagonist of this stage. Doctor now looks at the trembling Ji Won, and there are two ways to escape this situation. One option is to let the incarnation of Guan Cheng die. The Battle of Huang Sandial is a battlefield that Silla wins thanks to Guan Chang's sacrifice. The morale of the Silla troops rises due to their anger, and that's how they win. And another way involves altering the course of events. Ji Won wonders what happens if it fails, to which Doc Jin nonchalantly responds that her country will perish. She chooses to go with the first plan. This is truly Queen Jin Xiao. She is considered an incompetent ruler for a reason. However, from the beginning, Doc Jin didn't mean to give her a choice. He uses the second method regardless of her opinion as he manipulates the two discs that make up the Gampyongwe. As he slowly turns the Earth disc, the constellations engraved on the disc start to burn brightly. Gampyongui is currently using the special option Echo of the Stars. It also allows Dokja to ask for help from a constellation. However, the constellation refuses his request, and the number of times Gampyongui can be used is reduced when the constellation responds to the request. He thinks about how people are fighting over the demon sword, but this device is actually the most powerful item in the area. As he starts calling out to the constellations, Chu Wanjin notices what Dokja is trying to do, but Sungkook pulls a sword and stands between him and Dokja. Dokja wants to call Huarang leader King Hyunmu the Great. A part of the sky suddenly darkens, and a shadow falls to the ground. The battle between Scylla and Beak stops. After a while, Dokja looks at the sky, and one of the stars shines brightly. The constellation King Hyunmu the Great looks at Dokja. Dokja calls him that because he is the leader of the Huarang. But something unexpected is happening. The constellation King Hyungu doesn't want to be involved in the history of modern life and rejects his request. Dokja panics as the constellation is about to fade away when Sangha interrupts. Sangha notices who King Hyungu the Great is. She knows he wants to respect history but wonders if he has any regrets. The battlefield is where the young Huarang are sacrificed and countless people are buried. Meanwhile, the battle continues and Sungkook comes face to face with Chu Wanjin. The star in the sky shines brightly again indicating he's listening to Sangha. She informs him that she knows history doesn't change. The soldiers on the pitch aren't comforted, and the lives of the young Huarang don't return. But the history here is still ongoing, so she wants him to help alter the history of this place. Dokja quickly remembers how good of a talker Sangha is. During her early days, she was the queen of presentations at work. Finally, the constellation King Hyungu responds to her request. One of the constellations on Gampyongui disappears, and a light from the star in the sky shines on Dokja. He temporarily receives the protection of the constellation. At the same time, he endures the pain as his heart pumps, and light and darkness cross several times in his head. Something is being constructed inside him. Now, there is the authentic voice of the constellation. He wants Dokja to lend him his voice so he can unwind his sorrows. As Dokja agrees to his request, sparks surround him. Everyone on the pitch at Huang Sandial looks at Dokja, and Sangha is worried for him. Jayabik, Chu Wanjin, is astonished. As Dokja opens his eyes, his voice has a strange depth as he greets Chu Wanjin. In the distance, the incarnation of Guan Cheng staggers as he recognizes him as his general. King Hyung Wu watches the world through Dokja, seeing how much time has passed that they don't have to pay him any respect. Chu Wanjin is laughing madly at these words. It is a laugh filled with deep-seated resentment. His eyes suddenly glow red, indicating that Jayabik is in control of him. Through Dokja, King Hyung Wu declares his intention to comfort the soul of the unfortunate constellation and correct the history of modern humans. Dokja moves his right hand, and a bluish glow grows from the hilt of his sword. The power of the Star Relic Blue Dragon Sword is currently stored in unbroken faith. Now, he sticks his sword to the ground and calls upon the men of the Yang Weyangdo. Something is happening in the crack. The forgotten ghosts buried in history start to appear. They are Kim Yushin's elite unit. Simply put, it is a ground version of the ghost fleet that Jihai uses. Dokja orders them to attack, and they all begin to attack Beak's army. Meanwhile, Min Siab arrives early at the place and walks towards the battle with Dokja's invisibility cloak. He is stunned to see an army of skeletons fighting the humans. Kim Yushin's army clashes fiercely with Jaya Beak. His incarnation was so severely hurt that he could no longer survive. 
and through Dokja, the constellation warns Jayabik that he could perish along with his avatar because he has possessed Chu Wanjin, and they're already sink too profoundly. But he mocks Kim Yushin for not knowing much about this world. The incarnation of Jayabik is now at his limit, but he's still regretting that he couldn't have a duel with him. From the back, Sangha explains to Sungkook that Jayabik had always won against Kim Yushin until the Battle of Huang Sandial. Jayabik finally kneels to the ground, massively injured from all the spears that pierced through him. Kim Yushin waited before pulling out his blade. Dokja hurriedly took back control of his voice and told Kim Yushin that he couldn't be killed with his hands because he was under the King of No Killing Elf. Kim Yushin nodded as if he understood and gestured for one of his skeleton armies to execute Chu Wanchen. He says his goodbyes to Jayabak. Then, the incarnation's head quietly flew through the air. In the end, the stage transformation has ended, and the protection starts to disappear. Dokja looked around and saw that Beak's army was wiped out. Sungkook's voice expressed his worries, and Sangha sighed with relief while Gilyoung was disgruntled that he couldn't do much. As they approach Dokja, he tells them it is time to go to the north because he sent some of Kim Yushin's army to collect other group's flags. It only takes a short time for Dokja and his party to arrive at the north where the throne sits. Most of the smaller groups have already died because of the skeleton army Dokja sent. Sungkook was astonished to see Dokja take every flag to the ground, and not long after, his Chungnuro flag turned purple. Suddenly, Kim Yushin's voice was heard in Dokja's head. He wonders why Dokja's mind is intact despite hearing his voice, but Dokja only says he has a strong mentality. He was a bit surprised by the words. The constellations used indirect messages to communicate for a reason. Most people would pee their pants or faint upon hearing a constellation's voice. Then Kim Yushin reminds Dokja that he owes him a significant debt. To help Dokja earlier, he had to embrace more possibilities than necessary. Dokja notices something sinister about his tone, so he quickly expressed his appreciation. Out of nowhere, he starts to notice that Dokja doesn't have any supporting constellations. Dokja already had an ominous feeling. True to that, Kim Yushin offered to be his sponsor. His words were nice but merely meant to be his slaves. Choosing his words carefully, Dokja politely rejects his offer. Even if gather the Huorang stigma was good, that was when applied to Kim Yushin's saga. Dokja is well aware that he was trying to scam him for being the strongest. The words were ridiculous for someone who wasn't a fabled greater. Dokja acknowledges they had fun together but suggests Kim Yushin take a break since he's pretty old. Kim Yunshin was silent momentarily, watching Dokja from his screen, perhaps because his pride was pricked. Dokja thought he would come back, but a sharp pain suddenly shot through his head. Currently, Kim Yushin is connected to Dokja through the Gampyongui. Dokja began to lose control when his hand suddenly reached his sword. Sangha looked at him worriedly, but he told her to leave him immediately. His trembling right hand didn't listen when Dokja struggled to control himself. It's a sign Kim Yushin started to exert control over his body. He wants to see if Dokja's oath will break if he kills Sangha. Dokja could see his intent as clear as day. The second sponsor selection would begin the moment the fourth scenario was over, and Kim Yushin wanted to use this pledge as an opportunity to acquire him as an avatar. However, Dokja still refuses. He took a deep breath, and since this was his body, he would never give it to this guy or any constellation. The pages of Tessa flashed in his head. A light streamed through his head, and the light strings lined up. Then, his fourth wall skill was activated. Kim Yushin discovered something was wrong, and his presence became noticeably thinner. Dokja forcefully expelled him from his body, and his stars quickly dimmed. Then Kim Yushin was gone. As a result, Dokja is out of breath. Since the Gampyongui connection to the constellation is broken, the skeleton army begins to disappear around him. But from this point forward, the old geezer was still following him. Seeing that the army is gone, Sangha asks if Dokja is okay. Dokja looked down and found his limbs tied up with magic power but he roughly understood what was going on. She used binding thread on him during that short interval. He praises her for her quick judgment, but Sangha looked embarrassed when she untied him. When Dokja looked back, he saw Ji Won looking between him and Sangha with curious eyes. She's embarrassed because she couldn't help much, but Dokja tells her they'll likely become enemies the next time they meet. But Ji Won smiles and assures him that making new friends is the banner of their Huorang before moving away. Dokja took his companions and started to move to Guanghuamun. After they arrive, Dokja calls Minsiob. The next moment, Minsiob appeared out of thin air. The invisible cloak that he handed him in advance covered his body. His mission was to scout the National Palace Museum. When Dokja asks how many have entered so far, Minsiob replies that there are nine kings, including the tyrant and the first apostle. He also says that there are seven purple and two brown flags. In particular, there are two with an intense purple color and they belong to the tyrant and first apostle. After hearing all the information, Dokja tells Sungkook and Minsiob to wait outside and hide under the cloak, because he only needs Sangha and Gilyoung to enter the museum with him. 
As they approach the museum, Dokja got a new hidden scenario. He's given a choice of which dungeon he wants to complete. Dokja confidently chooses the three-man dungeon, the room of the copper acupuncture men. A bright flash engulfs everyone, and they suddenly arrive at the dungeon. Then, intermittent screams could be heard from the dungeon. It was a monster in human form with a matte color. Some approach Sangha, and she swings her swords to cut at the copper men, but they don't receive much damage. Instead, they pull the incarnation's bodies down. She starts to retreat and asks Dokja how to kill them. Dokja tells her to look at their bodies. The acupuncture copper man was a relic that displayed 354 acupuncture points. Some glow in different colors, and if she hits one of them, they could paralyze, silence, or even kill them. Then Dokja stabbed one of the acupuncture points on the copper man. And soon, the body scattered into powder. Now that he shows them how it's done, he tells Sangha and Gilyung to finish the dungeon quickly. Dokja got the skill he aimed for. And after, he asked them to go to the hidden dungeon, where they could get the four yin demonic beheading sword. Yu Sangha asked with surprise because Dokja had already told them that the sword wasn't necessary to obtain. But Dokja corrects her by saying they're not going to hunt the items, but the kings who hunt them. Sangha and Gilyung immediately understood what he meant. But they had different interpretations. Sangha thinks he wants their flag, but Gilyung thinks he will kill them. Yu Sangha looked down at Gilyung with surprised eyes. Interestingly, Gilyung looked up and told Dokja that he'd kill them for him. Apparently, he already noticed that Dokja couldn't directly kill a person. Dokja tells Gilyung to be careful, and he can see what Sangha is worried about. When they arrive at the hidden dungeon door, they must spend 10 ancient coins to enter. So, Dokja asks Sangha and Gilyung to give him 3 of their coins, and he will use 4 of his own. Soon, he puts the coins in the empty slots, and after he sticks each coin to it, the door flashes with a bright yellow light. When the door opens, Sangha and Dokja are surprised by the sight. The center of the room contained a big bonfire using the dead bodies as fuel, and hundreds of bodies were scattered all over the place like graves. He could see the faces of some survivors, but he didn't know if they were allies or held a truce. They weren't fighting. A group stood up, and greed could be seen in their eyes. Some people secretly moved behind the party, while others drew their attention. The encirclement was gradually becoming narrower. The pests upset many constellations, who want Dokja to eliminate them quickly. One of them started questioning again. Then, the white light of unbroken faith filled the air. The unstoppable trajectory cuts through a person's limbs. A confused person shouted to everyone to kill Dokja. The people took out their weapons like they had been waiting, but it was too late. They didn't have high-level skills, so no one other than the Seven Kings could follow his movements. The Blade of Faith swung in a semicircle, cutting five or six people simultaneously. As soon as the people collapse, Dokja looks at his party to find Sangha glancing at Gilyung with a grim expression when she sees him kill someone like an insignificant insect. Dokja is also a little surprised. Then Sangha comes forward and volunteers to do it in his stead. Her tone is unusually stubborn. She holds her sword and turns her back to Dokja, telling him she will do the dirty work instead of Gilyung. Since Sangha moves even more efficiently than Gilyung and takes the lives of the remaining people, her fingertips tremble as the work finishes. Sangha uses an analogy as she pretends to be calm before him. Gilyung grumbles that he can do it better, making Sangha place a hand on his head. There are many twists and turns in the future, and Dokja wonders what he should do now. Now, the sound of clapping is heard. A man from the big bonfire approaches Dokja with a smile on his face. He shows no signs of panic despite the other group being wiped out. The man raises both hands as if he has no intention of fighting. As Dokja looks closer at the man, he has a giant spear on his back. He praises Dokja and his party for wiping out the Chengjiang group without passive skills. It seems they are one of the groups that lost their king, and that's why they come forward so recklessly. However, the man tells Dokja he is a little late since the prominent kings have all entered the dungeon. Some even believe that the tyrant king owns the absolute throne, but the man is confident that his king sits on the throne. Dokja follows the man's glance and thinks his king may be at one of those doors. Then he realizes why this man is still in the waiting room. This guy is a recruiter. In contrast to his loyalty, he is a very realistic guy, but he is a real loyalist. Dokja also vaguely remembers. It doesn't happen in the third regression, but the anti-tyrant king alliance forms many times in Tessa. Once again, the future changes. Then the man turns as he hears one of the seven doors open, and the group, scattered all around the room, starts running closer. Sangha tells Dokja to turn and look, and he is immediately stunned at what he sees. He is a clean-shaven man with an eye patch. He holds a brown club in his hands and dresses like a monk. Both Dokja and Sangha are stunned at what they're seeing knowing exactly who that is. Meanwhile, the one-eyed man converses with the man in the ponytail before he looks at Dokja. Through his profiling skills, Dokja knows the man's name, Sang Young Cha. The man is indeed one-eyed Maitreya's sponsor, as he suspected. 
As the one-eyed man and Dokja shake hands, Dokja thinks it's hilarious if he one is here, because she will start speaking nonsense about him being his sponsor again. Suddenly, he asks Dokja to predict his future and Dokja willingly agrees. His skill, mind reading, is quite interesting among the investigation techniques in Tessa. It doesn't reveal the opponent's attributes, but it is a skill that roughly gives information about the opponent's personality. In other words, he sees someone like Hyunsung as an easily fooled demonic enemy, while he sees someone like Myongo as a backstabbing demonic enemy. And now, for example, Dokja silently reads his mind as Sang-young discovers that Dokja is a demonic enemy that shouldn't be touched. With a pale face and obvious distress over the outcome, Sang-young screams. Upon hearing his words, the group members of the Maitreya King all simultaneously looked at him with worry. The atmosphere is tense, and Sang-young urgently says it's a mistake. He is a fool to ignore the warning of the constellation. Perhaps the one-eyed Maitreya doesn't want to fight with Dokja. However, what is concerning is the reaction of the man with long hair. It is momentary, but his expression of regret is on his face. Then Sang-young says the plan will go as planned in an hour before returning to his group members. The long-haired man is relieved that Dokja is not labeled a demon. But as Dokja looks carefully at the long-haired man, he finally asks who he is. He chuckles as he introduces himself as Han Suo. Dokja immediately uses his profiling skills, but he is stunned when he is not registered in the character list. As he looks back at the shamelessly speaking Han Suom, he can't help but laugh. Dokja knows who this person is, and they both share an awkward laugh. Suddenly, someone shouts that the kings are coming. Tension fills the Maitreya group as several people in the waiting room cheer. Dokja watches the kings walk out the door and asks Suung if they're on the same side. On the left, we have Yoon Jiung, also known as the Coward King, and on the right is Kim Biko, also known as the Brawl King. The last one to come out is the Earth Dragon King Gu Disung. When Disung discovers Sang-young and greets him with mockery, Sang-young mocks him back by comparing him to an earthworm. Sangha is startled when she hears their words and whispers to Dokja that Disung's constellation might be Jonhuan. Historically, the King of Beak is said to have been born from an earth dragon. So, the other kings call him the son of an earth dragon mockingly. Dokja is amazed by her. She figured out Disung's identity just from history and she's right about it. In his memories, as he watches the kings talk to each other, he is one of Seoul's seven kings, with the late King Jonhuan as his sponsor. Actually, it's not a coincidence that there are so many incarnations whose sponsors are all kings of some kind. The situation is similar in other areas, not just the Seoul Dome. Japan has a competition between the three heroes, including Oda Nobunaga. In the UK, there is a competition between Richard the Lionheart, and Henry VIII. The kings gather in the middle and give a speech to march to the third door and take down the tyrant king. He already receives two jewels from this dungeon and cowardly raids kings. Some of the people present lost their king to him, and that's why this waiting room is a field of corpses. Dokja believes he can acquire all seven star jewels at once since the four kings possess one each, and the tyrant king has three. The speech lacks substance, but people are getting excited. They are like real revolutionaries fighting for justice. After receiving the orders, hundreds of people enter through the third door. Sang-young and Dee-sun lead at the front, and Dokja, with his party, are moving in line with them. Soo-young walks beside Dokja and then starts talking about how all of this feels like a martial arts novel. It is impossible to miss when discussing fiction. Dokja discusses a common development in these cliché novels, and Soo-young listens intently. Then, some have a plot twist, like the fake treasure map and everyone walking into a trap. For Dokja, this plot is a cliché, and it is a Suung thing that these plots are tried and true. Dokja silently sneers at his response and says that those who write such clichés shouldn't be writers. Suung's expression slightly hardens as he asks what he would do if he were a writer. Dokja stops for a second because he never thinks about being a writer since he's a reader, as his name suggests. However, Suung believes that a reader would do the same. Writing familiar clichés to provide satisfaction to the readers. Dokja smiles and asks why he is speaking as a writer. He doesn't think the clichés are bad. At the very least, a plagiarist shouldn't use it. Dokja finds it amusing to see Suung's face changing colors. He tries to defend himself by saying that even if the story is similar, it doesn't mean it is plagiarized. But Dokja claims he would do things differently instead of copying other people's work. Then he raises unbroken faith and cuts his neck. There is no blood visible as his head falls. He adds that there is no excuse for him to keep hiding. Shortly after, Su Yung's head speaks from where it lies on the ground. People are shouting with alarm from all sides. There are confused voices and voices filled with murder happening. As Dokja picks up his severed head, he asks if Su Yung is his real name. Su Yung is the first apostle, as Dokja thinks. He smiles, knowing he is right that Dokja spreads the text novel. But Dokja replies that he scatters only the text version of his plagiarized novel. 
Upon hearing Dokja's comparison of Tessa with his novel, the man behind him yells at Dokja, urging someone to kill him. However, they are cowering in fear of the talking head. Furthermore, they will soon have no room to worry about them. Dokja expects the cliché he mentioned earlier to come to life. He waits, and there is a burst of light. The rings of light move across the crowd, drawing lines of blood on the bodies of some people. Someone is screaming as blood spurts from a body that has been cut to pieces. The people in the back are screaming and moving. From across the tunnel, a neutral voice comes from the large palanquin. It belongs to the Tyring King. Dokja shouts at Sangha and Jiung to retreat. Now, the Tyring King orders them to move, and his palanquin approaches the group of people. The three rings of light mercilessly sweep over the battlefield. Dozens of people are dying at once. The battle lines instantly become bare. The terrified group members retreat, including all four kings. In the tense silence, everyone closes their mouths like lifeless mice. The Tyrant King walks out of the palanquin, and an aura covers his entire body. Doctor uses his profiling skill on him, and he figures out how he is so strong because he uses three packages. The three-wheeled ring isn't something the original Tyrant King has. He indeed has some profits. He also notices that the Tyrant King is increasing his synchronization with his sponsor. Several Dokkabees, including Bihyung, stare at him from the air. They were prepared to make a plausibility request if he violated plausibility. Now, he declares that he's going to rewrite history. The current ruler of the Korean Peninsula, who is not recorded as a king in history, is named Yonsengun. A tremendous magic power emerges from the Tyrant King as synchronization with the sponsor is limited. The ring is moving again, and the group members in the way are dying in an instant. However, the anti-Tyrant King alliance is also unbelievable. In addition to the other kings, there is the Maitreya King and the Earth Dragon King. Once the kings unite, they all start to fight back. As Sangha, Gilyung, and Dokja hold Suyung's head, they watch from the side. He wonders why he isn't going to help. Suyung laughs at his words. Apparently, he won't let Dokja have the sword to himself because he has been preparing for today much longer than Dokja. Suddenly, the voice of the intermediate Dokkabi is heard in the air. The battlefield quiets down at Dokkabi's voice. He is saying that he will reveal the second qualification test. They must remove the other kings around them to gain the right to challenge it. And only five kings challenge the final qualification of the absolute throne. There are currently 14 kings remaining. Dokja is a bit surprised. There are 12 kings in this dungeon. The Tyrant King laughs at the confused people and tells them to focus on killing each other's king. But Disung is telling everyone to focus on killing the Tyrant King. Suyung's head suddenly shouts to everyone that Dokja is also a king. Dokja quickly tramples on Suyung's head, but everyone's attention is already focused on him. It is the moment when the death of one of the remaining kings is decided. Along with his party, Dokja draws his sword, but then there are people secretly moving behind the kings and killing one of them while the Maitreya King and Earth Dragon King take a significant hit from the surprise attack. The Prudent King and Fighting King are exhausted. Three men attack the Tyrant King from behind, stabbing him in the side and thighs. Dokja quickly realizes who is behind this. The humans who betray their kings don't bleed when the Tyrant King kills them, and someone quickly takes the gems of the Fallen Kings. The Star Jewels move through the hands of the hidden avatars and gather in one person's hands. A girl moves through the air and laughs as she lands in a niche. Dokja didn't expect a woman, but she is clearly a plagiarist. She holds the seven jewels in her hands, emitting light, and is known as the Fake King. Suung doesn't waste time summoning the four yin demonic beheading sword by sacrificing the crystals. Ultimately, the plagiarist writer owns the four yin demonic beheading sword. A dazzling magic power pours out of the four yin demonic beheading sword and sweeps through the battlefield. Sangha worries about what she should do next, but Dokja assures her everything will be okay. Yu Sangha makes a strange face at his nonchalant words, and Gilyoung is confused because he thinks the sword is a great item. Suyung starts moving forward and kills everyone in her path. However, people don't die when she tries to kill them, leaving her confused. Dokja watches the scene with delight, wishing he could tell her the truth. The weapon isn't famous because it is strong, but because the original owner is strong. Suung is confused and shouts, what's wrong with the sword? Meanwhile, other people are closing in on her, trying to get the sword. She tries to fight them back, but unfortunately, she is pushed back to where Dokja is standing. He tries to offer help, but she cries out and waves her sword again. The Tyrant King recovers his confidence and starts attacking, while the other kings also start to fight. The battle quickly becomes a melee with no allies. As Dokja tries to fight back, he wonders when Jung Hyuk will come. The northern region of Seoul is far away, but there is enough time for him to return. The signboard in the air changes, and the number of kings slowly depletes. Dokja smiles, fully aware of who killed them all. The surrounding kings are filled with fear. The number of kings starts decreasing for an unknown reason. People worry because someone kills the kings. On the other hand, someone is rejoicing. The tyrant king continues to kill everyone in his way. 
Then, as he is about to fire the three ring loop again, the ceiling collapses and the tyrant king falls. The people near the unusual scene tremble and flop down. A man kills the tyrant king in a single blow as if he were a bug. Suung looks at the scene in disbelief. The strongest of the seven kings in Seoul is not the tyrant king. The explosion clears, his appearance is gradually revealed, and he holds a black flag. The survivors, everyone looks at him with captivation. A furious voice rings through the battlefield and calls Dokja. He smiles and waves toward Jung Hyuk. The strongest king in the seven kings of Seoul is the supreme king, Yu Jung Hyuk. For some mysterious reason, he is furious with Dokja, and his aura is filled with darkness as he threatens to kill him. As Jung Hyuk approaches with anger in his steps, Dokja thinks about how amazing he is. Dokja sends him to the north, but he already has a black face. And from his current appearance, it seems Jahai and Hiwon are doing a good job. So, Sokja takes a few steps back, looks at Suung, and tells her to hand over the sword. Han Suung's eyes shake, knowing no one can stop Jung Hyuk. Then, Dokja turns to Gilyung, and his eyes turn white like Dokja is waiting. After a while, the sickle of a praying mantis flies through one wall. The entire cave shakes with the immense power of the giant insect king, distracting Jung Huk. Dokja takes the opportunity to strike Suung. She groans and lets go of the four yin demonic beheading sword. But Dokja doesn't stop there, as he picks up the sword and the flag hanging from Suyung's back as a bonus. His purple flag turns into a black flag, and he wastes no time running straight toward the tyrant king, with Suyung shouting from behind. Dokja ignores her and quickly sweeps up the tyrant king's items, including the three-wheeled ring and a dragon jar. However, it only takes a short time for Jung Hyuk to chase after him at a frightening speed. He narrows the distance to Dokja in an instant. So, Dokja chooses to hide behind Disung. Jung Hyuk relentlessly cracks his opponent's head as he obtains the flag. Now, Dokja decides to stop running away. He tries to talk things out with Jung Hyuk but asks about his sister's whereabouts. It is only two words, but Dokja instantly understands. Fortunately, Jihai handles things safely. Jung Hyuk receives the note about his sister at the perfect moment. Dokja tries to act clueless, but Jung Hyuk uses lie detection on him, making it impossible to lie anymore. Jung Hyuk is like this entirely because of his plot. Dokja tries to reason with him, but Jung Hyuk refuses to listen to anything from him. He is accusing Dokja of taking his family hostage, but Dokja doesn't intend to harm him or his family. However, Jung Hyuk notices that Dokja is buying time, and his expression cools. He regrets his choice not to kill Dokja sooner. As Jung Hyuk raises his sword, a voice is heard from the air. The intermediate Dokabi appears at this moment. He halts the fight, making Dokja feel relieved because he can get away from Jung Hyuk's anger. The Dokabi announces that all the qualifications are met, with only five kings remaining in the scenario. A spark suddenly covers the remaining kings, including Dokja and Jung Hyuk, who are forcibly moved through space. Jung Hyuk reaches out for Dokja, but it is too late. All the kings disappear, leaving people confused. Sangha carries the unconscious Gilyung while Suyung silently fumes that her plan goes to waste. Meanwhile, the landscape is changing. In the next moment, there is the sound of Dokja bumping his head against something. In a moment, Dokja notices that he is disqualified from the last phase of the scenario. He looks up at the sound of laughter and sees the ridiculing face of the intermediate Dokabi. Dokja thinks he is playing tricks on him, but an unexpected message flashes. It turns out he still needs to occupy his target station, Changsun, which is one of the qualifications to enter the last phase. The Dokabi smirked as Dokja contemplated his next move, observing the people inside the dome engaged in battle. Then he sees Sangha rushing over here while carrying the collapsed Gilyung. But behind her, Hiwon runs to her side while holding the hands of an unknown girl. The little girl asks if her brother is in this place, while Dokja wonders why they are here. Hiwon isn't supposed to be here right now. After saving a girl from the Gangbuk area of Seoul, she waits at Changshin Station. Hiwon's job is in this scenario, but Hiwon replies that she can't wait any longer because the girl hasn't eaten since morning. She wonders if Dokja truly cares about his sister. In Hiwon's words, the girl points to Dokja and says he's not her brother because he's ugly. Dokja silently curses at the girl. Hiwon is surprised as she looks at Dokja and the girl. It is natural for Hiwon not to know. Dokja plans for Jung Hyuk to go north after she gives his note to Jihai back in the cinema dungeon. Then, she sends Hiwon to save his sister so she can manipulate Jung Hyuk. He is wondering if his plan ends here, but he knows he has to challenge it, even if he is late. So, he plans to take over Changsun, making Hiwon wonder why she should go there. Then, Hiwon tells the girl to bring something out. Yu Jung Hyuk's sister, Mi Yu, puts her hand in her mouth. After a moment, her mouth is abnormally large, and an unusual sized stone emerges. Mia has an exclusive skill called inventory. Dokja moves towards the chunk of stone and wonders what that is. He examines the rough surface of the stone. He sees a small groove that can hold something. 
Young Hee Won shamelessly exclaims that she only needs the flag to occupy the station, so she brings it here. Doc Ja tries to say something but falls silent. No one in Tessa has ever done this before, and he's speechless. Hee Won wonders about the holdup when he only needs to plant his flag. Doc Ja finally pulls out the flag and puts it on the stone. He does it, and both Hee Won and Mia are clapping. Now that Doc Ja meets the qualification, his body is covered in the light again before he is moved to the battlefield of the Last King's qualification. When he opens his eyes, he sees Jung Huk fighting sang -ung, and he receives a notification that all their stats will equally decrease to 10. The current king's test. It is an extreme trial that has to be overcome with his body alone. The absolute throne is in the center, and King of Beauty Ji Won stands on the side. At the same time, Maitreya King sang -ung and Supreme King Jung Huk are fighting each other. Now, the middle-aged man is in the corner. Dok Ja is sure that he is the neutral king. When he sees Dok ja, he raises his hands, indicating that he abstains from fighting for the throne. Sang Young tries to attack Jung Hyuk with his staff, but Jung Hyuk quickly dodges below. Jung Hyuk's kick strikes Sang Young's abdomen as a counterattack. Meanwhile, Ji Won looks behind them and sees Dok ja. She will fill out the other king's qualifications if she comes to this place. Dok ja tells her that he is going to attack her if she doesn't abstain, but she thinks of it as a challenge. After receiving a kick from Jun Hyuk, there is an abrupt, loud noise. Sang Young slides around on the floor in agony. Ji Won is surprised as she notices. It has been an equal fight until now, but something is changing gradually. Skills and stigmas cannot be used, but Jung Hyuk's attacks are getting faster and harder. It isn't just Jung Hyuk's combat sense. If Doctor remembers correctly, Jung Hyuk knows the loophole from the last phase. The funny thing is that this battlefield controls everything except for one factor. It is the use of the coins. Doctor also sees that Jung Hyuk is investing coins to boost his stats. Then, the intermediate Dokkabi laughs, explaining that the coins are the hard-earned work of the Avatar, so they should have a chance to use them. Min Ji Won and Sang Ung's complexions darken once they hear the words of the intermediate Dokkabi. They may not have many coins left. It is natural. They can't save coins on the battlefield between kings. But Jung Hyuk is different. He grows by breaking through all types of hidden scenarios from the beginning. He always carries an appropriate amount of coins in reserve. Jung Hyuk wastes no time and kicks Sang Ung until his body flies through the air. The information from the Dokkabi is still shocking Ji Won as he passes by. Jung Hyuk looks at the nearby Ji Won. She jumps with surprise and hurries to raise both hands. Finally, Jung Hyuk turns towards Dok ja. His eyes became calm. It is understandable. If he takes the absolute throne, he can control all kings. He is having trouble retrieving his sister from Dok ja, but not in the scenario that he tampered with from the beginning. Dok ja knows he estimates his stats and how many coins he has left. However, his pride caused his defeat this time. Dok ja is laughing at Jung Hyuk. It is because there isn't any king in Seoul who has more coins than Dok ja right now. Jung Hyuk's eyes widen as he realizes what is about to happen. He invests so much in his stats that his power is now above human's level. Without wasting any time, he adjusts the power in his fist. Now, there is a sound like a sonic boom inside the dome. Jung Hyuk is stunned at what is happening, and he quickly spends more coins to boost his stats as well, but he's too late. Dok ja moves too quickly, and by the time he swings his sword, Dok ja swiftly moves under him and delivers an uppercut. Jung Hyuk launches into the air like a bat hitting a baseball. A flying Jung Hyuk hits a barrier, bounces in the opposite direction, hits another barrier, and lands on the ground after repeating this ping-pong action five or six times. The Dokkabi sees the conflict from above and realizes that Dokja is gaining the upper hand. Meanwhile, Dokja wonders if he hits so hard that he accidentally kills Jung Hyuk. He runs towards Jung Hyuk with a bit of confusion. After kneeling down and carefully pulling Jung Hyuk off the ground, to find himself staring directly at Jung Hyuk. Despite receiving a punch with 100 levels of strength, he appears to be still conscious. Dok ja is trying to call him again, and he is starting to wonder if he is fainting with his eyes open. Knowing that he didn't kill him, Dok ja begins to tell him to be nicer when they meet and not threaten to kill him while he continuously slaps his swollen face. A notice appears after some time, indicating that Jung Hyuk couldn't participate in the battle anymore, making Dok ja the only king who survives the battle. The ward in the air slowly disappears, and many constellations are happy with the ending. Dok ja also hears messages about historical grade constellations. Ji Won's constellation is mortified. People are gathering around, including Dok ja's friend. However, the intermediate Dokkabi looks somewhat dissatisfied. He doesn't expect Dok ja to win, yet he wins. So, he has no choice but to announce him as the current owner of the absolute throne. But Dok ja stops the intermediate Dokkabi who is about to launch the system messages. As he approaches the absolute throne, he wonders what he can earn from it. Right now, all constellations observe the soul dome and focus on Dokja. The absolute throne shows off its golden charm as if waiting for Dokja. 
the Dokkabi explains that he becomes an omnipotent power. After hearing Dokkabi's explanation, the folks gaze at him enviously. So Dokja begins questioning whether he can act beyond the plausibility constraints if he has absolute power over the land he controls. But Dokkabi is left speechless as Dokja sneers, fully aware that he's lying and that the management would have a field day if they caught him attempting to scam Dokja. The intermediate Dokkabi expression hardens. He then declares that he has to finish the scenario and tells Dokja to sit on the throne, or he will destroy it. To his surprise, Dokja lets him do it because he refuses to take the throne. As he looks at the Dokkabi and the people staring, he declares that he will never sit on the absolute throne. There is the sound of thunder in the sky, and it starts to rain. Meanwhile, other people and the king in the area are stunned at his words. The intermediate Dokkabi appears to be angry at Dokja. Dokja insists once more that he will not take his place on the throne. Storm clouds descend on Seoul, bringing with them thunder and lightning. Other people worry as they see Dokja refuse. However, the Dokkabi warns Dokja that the Soul Dome will not survive the fifth scenario. He keeps talking like he thinks it's going his own way. Dokja looks at the Absolute Throne. Like Dokkabi says, he knows the fifth scenario is challenging to clear without the Absolute Throne. However, he also knows what Dokkabi isn't saying. If he uses this Absolute Throne once, he will never be able to reach the end of the scenarios. As Junhyuk lies unconscious on the ground, he recalls how, in the original work, Junhyuk only notices this during the 14th regression. Now, an agitated person appears among the crowd. The man wonders why he doesn't take the throne and spits at Dokja like he is insulting him. Dokja turns towards the man and asks why he wants Dokja to be his king without knowing whether or not Dokja will kill him after becoming king. The man stiffens momentarily, and Dokja continues watching the people around them. He criticizes their ignorant behavior, as they forget their way of life and act like citizens of a kingdom. Dokja also adds that he refuses to be a king for humans like them. He looks up at the sky while telling the constellations that he doesn't want ugly constellations like them to be his sponsors. After that, Dokja moves before the throne and holds his blade, a silent statement that he doesn't allow other people to sit on the throne. He continues to speak as he stares at the Dokkabi. He knows how much the once obedient people will pay to leave this situation. There is an invisible rank among constellations. Just as some constellations watch the avatars, other constellations watch the constellations. To be precise, the low constellations are the ones being watched. G1 and Sangyang constellations, who are deeply engrossed in their avatars, listen to Dokja. Dokja yells at them, questioning how long they will continue to subject others to misery for their desires. Right now, the intermediate Dokkabi is making his move. At the same time, a system message appears, introducing a new sub-scenario. The goal is to claim the throne as their own. However, Dokja knows well how things unfold. Out of nowhere, Hyun bravely positions himself in front of Dokja, shielding him from the approaching crowd. Minsiob and Sungkook are also stepping up. Sangha quickly comes over and stands by his side. Dokja is constantly in the company of his devoted party members, who are there to look out for him. There are unexpected individuals as well. They are Jiwon and Sangyong. Dokja ponders which of his words touches their hearts. Yet, there is an undeniable shift that is taking place. However, it is only a small number. The Dokkabi tells them to start attacking Dokja and his party. People start running towards the throne. Soon, a war breaks out, and his party is basically fighting everyone else. Hiwon pushes through the people around and asks Dokja if he has a plan. Dokja tells her to buy him some time, and he slowly approaches the throne because he has a way to destroy it. Then he pulls out a sword, causing someone to cry out that he has the 4-yin demonic beheading sword. Not only does he have the sword, he also has the Gampyongui. Dokja wastes no time in activating it. The sky is growing darker, and as Dokja looks at the Dokkabi, he calls out to the seven stars of Big Dipper. He is now furious at Dokja but can't do much to stop him. The star navigation begins, and the six stars shine brightly at Dokja's call. His brain becomes overloaded the moment he contacts six constellations at the same time. The Great Bear Stars start to wonder why he calls them. They don't understand why Dokja does it the hard way when there's an easy path. Dokja is coughing up blood, indicating that his body can't handle the strain of contacting the constellation. However, he doesn't stop. He needs one more constellation to be called if he wants to use the 4-yin demonic beheading sword. But there are no constellations left on the sky disk. Dokja quickly gazes at the dragon jar he obtained from the Tyrant King. He is putting two items in the jar, intending to sacrifice the three-ring loop to recharge Gampyongui so he can call one more constellation. The jar is now flashing brightly, and his plan is working while people around the throne continue to fight despite the heavy rain. Dokja once again uses Gampyongui and calls one last constellation, the seventh star of the Big Dipper. The star is now lighting up at his call, and finally, the seven stars that make up the Big Dipper are all gathered. 
Simultaneously, the seven stars speak to Dokja, asking him what he wants. Dokja wants to cut off the tie the throne has with its owner, and he needs their power to do it. He does this despite being well aware of the risk. The final reward of the fourth scenario is the absolute throne. The throne is an item that borrows the power of rulers from the dark dimension. Looking back at it, Dokja knows it will be very convenient if he gets the throne, but Soul is undoubtedly going to be destroyed. It is the price to be paid for borrowing the throne's power. The stars question his motive when even the heavenly constellations fear the owner of the throne. However, Dokja doesn't intend to fight against the owner. He wants to sever the connection between the owner and the throne. The stars try to warn him of dying because of the plausibility, but Dokja is adamant. The seven stars are silent. Some time is passing. Now, their signs are engraved on the sword. A dazzling light wraps around the four yin demonic beheading sword and starts to burn with bright flames. The four yin demonic beheading sword evolves into a star relic. People are amazed by the bright flame on the throne, causing them to cease fighting altogether. Even Sangha and Hiwan are stunned at the sight. The star relic four yin demonic beheading sword is originally a ceremonial sword. It is a sword to cut off evil energy and prevent disasters. Daka swings the sword towards the absolute throne. There is a loud sound and fire flares. People get hasty as they see Dokja about to destroy the throne, and Hiwan yells at him to destroy it immediately. Dokja wields the sword like a madman and continues to hit the throne. Sparks flash, and finally, the throne begins to crack. Soon, it breaks in half and loses its light. After that, the flame around the sword disappears, and Dokja pants hard, seeing that the throne is now nothing but a pile of rubble. People are no longer moving. The scenario is over, so they don't have to continue. Now, Dokabi is angry and yells at Dokja. Now, he hears Big Dipper stars telling him to prepare for the flooding of probabilities. Dokja feels like something is pulling at his presence. As he tries to regain his mind, he feels an immense power tearing at his body, but he believes it is going to be okay. The probability becomes plausibility, and he tries to make everything plausible. Dokja is barely holding it because the pain is too great, but the Dokabi is happy to see that Dokja is now suffering immense pain. Blood pours out of his mouth, causing Hiwan and Sangha to worry. A star in the distant night sky shines quietly. Now, it just keeps multiplying. All the constellations look at Dokja and share the burden of plausibility. The intermediate Dokabi turns to look at the constellations, and he wonders why they are doing that. The Big Dippers also lend him strength and begin reaching out to him. They wonder if this is the kind of story Dokja wants to show them. Now, they call him the king of the world without kings, and from now on, they will watch him. Dokja looks up at the turbulent clouds that fill the sky. Notifications show that the fourth scenario is forcibly ending. People wonder what is happening. And then another notification appears and states that a new fable of the king of the kingless world is created. After the pain subsides, Dokja sits on the broken throne and starts to regain consciousness. He may not have the next regression, but he is determined to reach the end of the story in this world. Dokja wipes the blood pouring from his nose as the intermediate Dokabi approaches. He tells Dokja he is making the worst choice and will regret it. But Dokja laughs at him. For him, his words mean that he just won the game. His goal from the beginning has been to create his own narrative. However, some people find the situation perplexing, while others are concerned about what the enraged Dokabi will do. Some people cry out to the Dokabi, but his answer is cold. Now, the Dokabi points towards Dokja as the wet shoulders of the gathered people shake. Dokja turns into the sinner who makes the fifth scenario difficult, silently angering him. Right after that, he flicks his finger. Now, the people in Gwangwoman start to disappear like smoke. People are screaming and confused. This is something Dokja doesn't anticipate. He looks back and sees Hiwan, Sangha, Sungkook, and Miss Hyob. In the next moment, they all disappear, and he is the only one remaining in Gwangwoman. Dokja is at a loss for words as he sees the field that is now empty except for the dead bodies. He attempts to attack the Dokabi but only gazes at Dokja with a disturbing smile before snapping his fingers. Soon, Dokja disappears too, leaving the Dokabi laughing alone, seemingly pleased with what he just did. Dokja is moved somewhere else, and he's unconscious. He even dreams, but it is a dream before the end begins. When he heard the voice, he realized it was his high school days. Those were the times when the school gangsters beat him up. These are the days when he reads Tessa and hopes to be Joomhyuk. Someone is holding him in a chokehold and starting to mock his mom. His name is Song Minwoo. He recalls going to university and working well. But now, he doesn't know if he is still alive. Dokja activates his fourth wall, and his dream collapses, leaving him in the dark again. Now, Dokja uses Omniscient Reader's Viewpoint Stage 3, and voices start to overlap. They are the familiar voices of people he knows. He one is in a pub with various types of wine. Jihai is at school, and she touches her head as if someone had hit her. On the other hand, Hyunsung is trapped at a nearby military base. Dokja believes it is the intermediate Dokabi's doing. 
he creates a situation where the incarnations are scattered all over the place. Seeing he won't look confused, he tries reassuring her that he's fine, but he doubts she can hear him. After that, Omniscient Reader's viewpoint stage 3 ends, and Doctor slowly returns to consciousness as his eyelids open. He gets up and looks around. He notices it is a place where skyscrapers and high-rise buildings can be seen. That reminds him that he should be moved to a place related to him. Upon first glance, it looks like the rooftop of a high-rise building. Soon, he curses, realizing that this is the rooftop of his company, Minosoft. Dokja is wondering why he is here. When he recalls going to the rooftop with you after receiving a reprimand from team leader Han, it makes him feel strange. As he turns his head, he sees messages flashing in the air. There are 10 days before the start of the fifth scenario, so a sub-scenario starts as a filler. During this period, Dokja knows he has to move. He must take advantage of the chance to replenish his coins. Now, people's voices are heard from below the roof. He looks down and sees armed people entering the building, with others behind them. Minosoft is located near Siachogu, but in his memories, no king forces exist in the Siacho area. While carefully observing the armed people, he realizes something. They are likely the Wanderers. Dokja turns on his smartphone to look up the information in this area. Unfortunately, it is out of battery, so he goes inside. He needs to find a place to recharge the battery or find a spare battery. He walks through the QA team's office, where he works for a while. Feeling nostalgic, Dokja goes into the office and opens the drawers individually. Right now, someone enters and shines Dokja with a torch. Dokja is trying to cover his sight from the blinding light when he sees the man's face. It is you from the QA team. He is shocked to see him still alive. A few minutes later, Yu tells Dokja about what is happening at Minosoft. The first scenario starts with all the people on the night shift. The corridor of the company is filled with dead bodies. Then, his face changes when he tells Dokja that he killed his team manager. They are walking through the corridor when Yu asks where Dokja is. Dokja replies that he is on the Guanghuaman side of the bridge. But Yu doesn't listen to the end as he interrupts Dokja. He believes there is no need to pass through all the scenarios. Other people can break most scenarios if they hide well and employ reasonable tricks. Yu grabs Dokja's shoulder as they exit Mino Soft. People crowd around the company and a bunch of wanderers gather. Some of them are seen moving kidnapped people. Currently, an armed man asks who Dokja is, and Yu responds that he is one of his co-workers. He nods lightly, and the man passes by them. Dokja looks at the man and wonders who he is. Yu explains that he manages a coin farm. For a moment, he wears a dismal expression on his face. He shows Dokja a bunch of cages where two people are trapped inside, as if it is a zoo or police station but the wanderers around them scream with excitement. Inside the cage, two people are fighting each other. Some are even beaten to the inch of their lives. Outside the cages, the wanderers laugh. Dokja is shocked at the sight, but Yu is overjoyed. People kill each other inside the cage, and the wanderers cheer for it, reminding Dokja of a coliseum. Yu explains that they receive coins from these individuals, and in exchange, they provide them with food to sustain themselves. Then, he gives a chocolate bar to a man in a cage. Looking around the cages, Dokja is already aware of those in Tessa who first identified the system and figured out how to exploit it. The coin farm is the structure that those who first understand the world devise to take advantage of the system. Then Yu takes Dokja to one of the cages, where they put three people inside instead of two. Dokja is stunned to see a familiar face among them. Yu smiles, and he throws a sword inside. One of them takes the sword when Yu tells him that the other person around him used to be his boss. However, the man doesn't understand what he is talking about. Suddenly, a constellation blesses him with body armor, and he is surprised when he gets a message to get revenge. Yu reminds him that his boss takes him for granted and gives him a hard time. This is his opportunity to make them pay for what they are doing. Glancing at his sword, his body trembles, but soon, he stands up and faces the other while Yu encourages him. Dokja looks at him and realizes that Yu, whom he knows, is gone. Suddenly, he hears someone bring a new prisoner. As he looks to the side, he notices a familiar woman lying unconscious inside the cage. She goes by the name Han Suung, the plagiarist. 